Hello and welcome to EcoEye. In this programme, we take the wraps off the very latest in waste prevention ideas and bring you plans to increase our native forest cover. But first, we take a look at our future water needs. With last year seeing record tides and this year predicted to be even warmer and drier, where will we stand? With all the rain that falls in Ireland, we've been quite wasteful in the way we use water. But our population is growing rapidly and with it, our water supply is becoming critical. So in the future, water conservation is going to become a big issue. Water, as much as energy, is something we'll have to become more aware of as our growing population competes for natural resources, putting pressure on developing areas. Connor, with all the rain that we get in Ireland, do we need to conserve our water? We need to manage our water. Uh, managing is about what you take out and what you put back in. Um, we're going to have to manage it differently in the next 30 years. Climate change is going to have an effect. We're going to have a drier southeast and a wetter northwest. Very difficult to plan for us, but we are planning. The west region uh, is probably going to remain fairly self-sufficient. The east region is going to have to start some new supply and new balance tricks. Uh, it's going to have to perhaps take water out of uh, deep wells in Kildare and uh, Leash, and prob probably even take water out of the Shannon. With all the rain we're still getting, we still need to make these sort of measures. Demographics. Demographics. We're all living in the east. We're working in the east. We're going to want to try to have our jobs near where we live. So the huge numbers of people that are, are uh, putting pressure on water supplies in the east are, are going to be matched by uh, pressure from industry that are going to want to use the water and, more importantly, dispose of the liquid effluents that arise from people's sewage and from the effluents from industry. So water is going to be necessary for both of those. It's the water you take out is as important to consider as the water you put in. Managing is more than just conserving. It's about the totality of the environment. We clean huge quantities of water every day, but use only a small part of it for drinking water. Uh, the majority of water that's used uh, is used by the domestic market for our cooking, for our cleaning, for flushing our toilets, for having our baths and showers. And that water is, is an area where huge savings can be made by people having sensible uh, measures in their own home to match that. It is balanced by public sector work, which has been trying to balance the water conservation in very simple ways. Dublin City Council and related authorities over the last number of years have saved a huge amount of water by investing uh, tens of millions in a leak reduction programme, and they've managed to bring the leakage rates down, I think, from about 60% losses down to, I think, uh, less than 30%. A huge amount of saving in a very small period of time. That type of work could be replicated in people's homes. We're rapidly in the east coast of Ireland arriving at a situation where we're going to be faced with choosing between jobs or homes because industries that we depend upon for our uh, prodigiously successful economy at the moment in many instances are water hungry and uh, they can be huge amounts of water required for those factories often as much water going into one of those and out every day as a small town in Ireland and uh, we have to look in the east coast about which it is we want people or the jobs for those people. I went to Blessington in County Wicklow to find out what the main drains and resources currently are. So what about the commercial sector? Are they doing their bit to conserve water? Last year, Duncan, I was able to show you our telemetry system, and that tells quite accurately where water is going within about a 1,500 house block. We're now metering all our commercial users, and they use about half the water and by metering them, we hope to know exactly where the water is going, and we believe that will significantly help conserve water among all commercial users. Since our last chat, we've come through a very hot, dry summer, and we know for the future that with global warming, we may have more hot, dry summers ahead of us. Our population is growing, our per capita consumption is growing, but yet our water resources are static. So if we do not conserve water and plan for conservation in the future, then we are going to have problems down the road. A good example of that would be during the summer, on a good day now, another 40 million litres of water was needed for the Greater Dublin area. And we would say that at least half of that water was used on lawns and could be saved if people heeded this conservation message. With 2007 set to be even warmer than 2006, I decided to look at some new ideas to keep your garden green when the mercury starts to rise. Brenda, there seems to be an obsession with large, manicured, green lawns in Ireland. Do we need to water lawns in the summer? 
We definitely don't need to water our lawns as much as we are watering the lawns, Duncan. I would uh, suggest to people to allow, first of all, allow the grass to grow that little bit longer. Don't keep it really, really short. Don't keep it clipped too low. Also, if the grass is beginning to go yellow, if we have a dry spell, that's absolutely no harm for grass. Grass is a really good plant for quick recovery. Brent, an awful lot of care has gone into the planting here of this garden. How important are the plants themselves? You're really looking for drought tolerant plants and any plant with a very thick leaf. This is a terrific plant, sedum. Look at the size of the leaves, look at the thickness of the leaves. This is a plant that hardly needs any water at all. After that, ground cover plants. Terrific value, they'll grow year after year, they'll spread, and that's what you want. They're conserving their own moisture, they're protecting the soil, the soil is not being eroded. The important thing is to protect our gardens from wind damage. So it's wind. Wind, wind is the wind damage. Wind does a lot of damage to plant. It dries plants out. So the first step in a garden is to surround your garden in a layer of protection. Enclose it. Enclose it. Even if you don't have the space for a hedge or trees, you can use a fence. After that, everybody should get into composting. The wonderful end product that's coming out of our compost bins, get it into your soil. That's a thing called leaf mould, and I would use this as a mulch. Mulch is literally a cover. It's a so cover it's in between your soil. plants, and that will protect the soil from soil erosion and from drying out as well. Is it a good idea to use drinking water that we purify in our gardens? Tap water is chlorinated water. It's, it's been through this expensive process of being cleaned and it's full of chlorine. It's not to be recommended. And apart from that, it's, it's absolutely unnecessary. We really don't need to water our gardens using tap water. We can collect rainwater, for example. You can imagine the amount of water that we can collect from our roofs. In the old days, we used barrels fitted under our downpipes. Today, there are water butts and they're very simple to connect. This contains about 220 litres of water, and with this connection here, you cut your downpipe at the critical level here, insert this piece into the downpipe, you also then drill into the barrel here, at the right correct level here, very simple, and at the bottom you've got a tap that can connect your hose, very simple. Also on the top, you've got a lid for safety for children. Ireland's newfound wealth has resulted in a dramatic increase in consumer spending over the past 10 years. And with the population growing at record rates, we're now in the throes of an unprecedented spending binge. This new consumer culture thrives on disposability. Older products replace with newer, better models. The mobile phone is a particular icon of our throwaway culture. So now there are more people with more money to spend on more consumer products, producing more waste than ever before. As our economy has grown, it's clear that there is a direct correlation between increased consumerism and increased waste generation. What we need to do is break that link between waste generation and economic growth. We don't want to stop the economy from growing, we just want materials to be used more efficiently so that we generate less waste. Ireland is one of the big waste offenders, producing approximately 750 kilograms of municipal waste per person. Alongside this increase in waste generation is our difficulty in disposing of it. As a member of the EU, we're now committed to enforcing the waste pyramid. This is a hierarchy in tackling waste, which goes from prevention at the top, the best waste management option, to disposal at the bottom, such as landfill, which is the least favourable. Although we've made significant improvements in the areas of waste management, particularly in recycling, we need to do a lot more. Brian, people in Ireland today are recycling, but are they aware enough of prevention? We know how to recycle in Ireland. We recycle 35% of municipal waste. We recycle 20% of, of, of household waste. So clearly we know how to recycle. We do need to move, we need to evolve, if you like, waste management away from recycling and onto the next step, which is prevention. And that is about reducing the amount of waste that we actually generate in the first place. 
the Environment and Heritage Services, together with the Department of the Environment and local government in the Republic of Ireland, is continuing to promote the three R's, that is the reduce, reuse, recycle. The most important part of that is the reduce side or the prevention side. All oh, this junk mail. We've seen recently the Interreg funded television adverts with Dermot Gavin, for example, and they've had strong waste prevention messages in them. Well, contact the mail and preference service and tell them you don't want to receive any more unwanted mail and help prevent waste. But we recognise we need to do more and we will be looking and working hard towards future cross-border campaigns because the environment doesn't recognise borders. I'm out and about to try to find out what consumers really know about waste prevention and if they actually put it into practice. What would you girls know about waste prevention? Just to use the recyclable bags and I usually try and bring my own bag. Energy, saving energy. Would you make an effort to prevent waste at home, to reduce it? We have like a recycling. I try not to buy things that are packaged. Try and avoid, you know, the excess packaging. The only problem I have is when I bring this product home, it has too much packaging on it. We all know the amount of packaging waste has been increasing over the number of years with plastics a particular problem. We're working to educate the consumer into the fact that they have power, they do have choice in this matter. They can purchase their, their fruit and vegetables loose and uh, they can use, they can purchase items which have less packaging. John, have the consumers in Ireland, typically when they go shopping anywhere, got the right choice regarding packaging? We're, we're on the consumer side in this, and we think that up until now there's been very, very little focus, or not enough focus, on minimisation of packaging at the consumer end. I think a lot of it has been driven by uh, economic growth in this country, the desire for convenience, uh, single occupancy households, all of these things have put a demand on convenience foods and convenience packaging. But I think there is a shift in attitudes, and we certainly are, are alert to that and we're doing quite a bit of work with our own brand in terms of reducing the amounts of packaging that, that we, we generate. I think that all people supplying into, into Ireland need to look at the way they're packaging their product. Uh, after all, we're at the end of the supply chain. The, the consumer is the next level. I would be asking uh, suppliers to look at the way they're packaging their product, to ask themselves, can they minimise packaging more than they're currently doing? And I think they have a responsibility to do that. Most packaging waste is created at manufacturing level. In 2004, an estimated 850,000 tonnes was generated. This is the equivalent of 220 kilograms per person per year, compared to an EU average of 170 kilograms. The Packaging Prevention Programme, which aims to promote and assist companies in packaging prevention, is currently in development. Repack aimed to launch the programme this year. It's long overdue, and the business sector has been slow to take action so far in this area. I think a number of manufacturers are looking at their packaging and seeing where improvements can be made. I suppose we're all on a learning curve at the moment. Up to 1997, there was some recycling happening in Ireland, but really we were at about 12 to 14 percent of packaging being recycled. We're now at 64 percent. That is a significant increase in what's happening at the end of pipe. And Repack has, has worked at every stage with our partners to improve the amount of recycling and packaging in Ireland. Now we need to shift the focus from just recycling it and an end of pipe solution to a start of pipe and to ensure that no more packaging than is needed is placed on the market. While consumers can play their part in preventing waste, in reality they're limited by the choices made available by retailers and manufacturers. And it's the consumer who's left to foot the bill in disposing of it. Oh, hi, Karen. Hi, Duncan. Thanks for coming. Not at all. Do you do most of the shopping in your I home? do, yeah. I'm the cheese shopper for four of us. Is minimum waste important to you? Oh, it is, yeah. I do all the recycling, so I want to have as least amount of waste as I can get. I mean, it's good for the environment, but it costs as well to put stuff into your grey bin nowadays, so it is a factor. Right, well, look, I'm going to set you a challenge to see how much minimal waste you can achieve here today. OK. And I'll see you up at the checkout. OK. 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 okay. Following simple rules can greatly reduce the amount of waste we bring home. Choose economy packs. Choose longer lasting products. Choose to reduce the amount of items purchased in the first place. Choose products with recyclable packaging. Choose products with less or no packaging. And look out for biodegradable and reusable containers. Good. You've done your shopping. I have, yeah. That was quick. It was, no, it wasn't too bad yeah. today at all. So what have you got here? Now, this was a great find. This, this uh, wrapping here on this chicory, what I liked about those was the wrapping on them is compostable. You can put this in your compost bag. I can. I'm very pleased with that. 
got this turn up here. You can't get any better than no, that now. perfectly packaged wise. with its natural yeah. skin. Yes. Okay, apples and these. You've got the cling film and you've got the plastic here. Yeah. I think not. Nature's own wrapping on it. Couldn't be more need, perfect. Yeah. So these, I suppose, no way. Um, two types of milk, Tetra pack and plastic bottle. Yes, and this can go into a green bin. Yes, it can. So that's perfect. Uh, cucumber. That's two wrappers there. Right, two wrappings on it. I know. I think no. So you've two types of bread here. Even though the brown's good for you, but it's not in the proper wrapper, is oh, it? Oh, well, this is perfect. Yes. You know, it's just the paper. That yeah. couldn't be better, and it's hygienic too, that yeah. way. Yeah. We'll take that. So it looks like about 50% reject. Okay. Even though a lot of these are recyclable, they're not bad at all, mm. but I think this is the more. This is going to minimise your waste, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely, I can see that myself, yeah. Right, I see you've got your recyclable or your reusable bags here. That's yeah? right, yeah. So um, I'll take them and I'll pack. Well, look, thank you. And I see Caroline here is going to help you. All right. Thanks okay. a lot. Okay, thanks a lot, Duncan. Bye. Although there are some waste prevention initiatives in place at the moment, such as the light weighting of certain packaging materials and the use of reusable crates, it isn't enough. To remove Ireland from being top of the rubbish heap, consumers are going to have to get active and vote with their wallets. Remember, industry will only come up with solutions when they're convinced consumers want them. to plant more forests in Ireland for a sustainable future. We need wood for timber and for energy. We need wood for local employment. We need woodlands for enjoyment and for biodiversity and wildlife. But also because of climate change, we need to store carbon from the atmosphere. There's a great opportunity for us in Ireland to have our own timber rather than relying on and paying for imports. The people in charge of the task of getting more trees planted is the Forest Service, and I want to find out what they're doing to expand our forest resource. At the moment, we're planting about 10 to 14,000 hectares. Uh, that's about an area about the size of Ackle Island, but it's still not enough. We do need to push it further. We need to get closer to the 20,000 if we can. We've set ourselves a target of getting 17%. Right? That's modest by European terms, but it's the level which allows us to get the full range of benefits. And many of us are concerned about the impact that all this additional planting will have on the environment. When we're dealing with forestry, we're dealing with one of the most visible changes in the landscape that you can possibly have. We have to plan that properly. We traditionally have been planting Sitka spruce on poor soil, but as we have changed our type of forestry, because it's now mostly private, we're getting onto better and better soil. And the type of forestry that has been developed over the last 10, 15 years, smaller scale, more mixed, broadly is coming in there, that's all going to greatly improve the landscape, I think the impact the forestry has there. Forestry is long term like no other activity is long term. So forestry, you're thinking about an Ireland of 40, 50, maybe 100 years time, you have to imagine what that's going to be like. We're going to continue to change the landscape over time, so we better do it right. And what we're saying in forestry is that we recognise forestry is a big, big land change, and we want to do it right. And that's why we have that indicative forest strategy, so we know exactly what we're going to do into the future. What we've done is to, for the first time really in Ireland, we've pulled together all the data sets that exist, including a few we had to create ourselves, so that we can tell the opportunities and the constraints that exist for any single parcel of land in Ireland in terms of forestry, which allows us to put the right tree in the right place. OK, well, if we go into my office, we can have a look. So how does it work, Suzanne? Well, I have an application here that I can run through with you. Suzanne, isn't it amazing what digital mapping can do? Yeah. It's from a farmer in Kerry and he wants to plant some of his land with mainly uh, broad leaves and uh, some conifers. Um, and I've come back from the site 
and will support uh, oak and ash, the species that he wants to plant. And there's a kind of a drier area where the Scots pine will sit nicely. So I'll carry out some of our environmental checks. Um, the first one we look at is we need to look at the, whether there's a watercourse actually running through the area. Um, and as we can see, there is one running through the middle of this particular site. Um, and would you need to report this to the fisheries board? Or? Well, that's the next check that we can do is uh, we look to see whether it's sensitive for fisheries. So um, as we can see, it's in an area that's sensitive for fisheries. So we would uh, write to the local regional um, fishery boards and uh, ask for their comments on the proposed um, afforestation. And we would take on board any of the comments or considerations that they would have. The next database, um, it's looking at areas that are designated national parks or special areas of conservation or natural heritage areas. We'd also need to consult with the MPWS if the area, the proposed areas, was within three kilometres, and as we can see, it's not. This slide shows the archaeological sites and the national monument sites. Now, as we can see, there are a couple on the map here, but they're well away from the proposed site. The next uh, check that we do is look at landscape sensitivity. Um, so the areas in orange here are areas that are highly sensitive uh, landscape-wise. So this is scenic areas? These are very scenic areas, yeah. And as you can see, again, there's quite a lot uh, within the Kerry region. But there are also quite a lot that wouldn't have many constraints on it that so would be suitable for forestry. So all this green area now is suitable. Big area of land, isn't there? Suitable. There is, yeah. yeah. There are also maps that show where existing forestry is, so that we can see how well a proposed plantation will sit into the surrounding landscape. From our point of view, it's fantastic in terms of some years ago we would have checked paper maps in terms of the environmental constraints, whereas now it's all online. We can go very quickly show all the various environmental data sets. When they're updated, they're updated you know, o overnight and they're updated for all the various inspectors around the country. It is important to put the right tree in the right place and I suppose that depends on the type of area we're in. In upland areas, the higher up the mountain you go, in general, the less productive it is. The higher up the mountain you go, the, the less likely the area will be suitable for broadleaf. And that's why you see a lot of conifers concentrated in higher areas, the most elevated areas, and the broadleaves down in the valley slopes. That's just the natural way that broadleaves and conifers will grow. But also a lot of the, um, the high, higher elevated areas are also special areas of conservation and natural heritage areas. There's a higher concentration of ecologically important areas in the elevated areas. So certainly from a forest service point of view, we've been slowly moving down from the elevated areas into the, the mid slopes and the better quality land. In the fishery sensitive areas, we might also adjust the layout of the plantation, putting in extra sill traps, including extra buffer zones from rivers, particularly in particular sensitive catchments where there's salmon or trout. It's essential for Ireland that we plant a lot more because we need this resource. But it's also important that we don't repeat the insensitive and inappropriate planting of the past. We need to make sure that this major planting programme is managed well, so that our unique landscape is enhanced and the environment is safeguarded for the future. So we now have the tools, the technology and the policies to ensure that the right tree goes in the right place. In our next programme, we investigate the illegal dumping and burning of our household waste, our acidifying gas pollutants and their transboundary problems with Europe, and I visit the Leitrim-Fermanagh area to see ecotourism in action through the Green Box 